go. God is my strength. He is my salvation. God's strong right hand has done mighty things. God is so great, my soul celebration. God gives me words that makes my heart sing. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to God's house, and we welcome those who may be watching us online. Today is the Feast of Pentecost, so the colors are all red, and uh, we celebrate the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Our theme is, Empower Us, O Holy Spirit. Uh, before we continue, we're going to have a word from Open Arms Pregnancy Clinic. Alex Fitzgerald, who works there, is going to share with us a message. Say good morning, Alex. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. That's my impression. All right. Um, again, I am Alex, and I'm from Open Arms Pregnancy Clinic. I am, I am over uh, community relations, and also I run the men's program there. Open Arms is a Christian ministry offering life-affirming services to women and men facing unattended pregnancy and reproductive choices. We do that by offering pregnancy testing, ultrasound, pregnancy decision counseling, pregnancy and parenting classes, a baby closet stocked full of diapers, wipes, formula, and baby clothes. All of our services to the community are free of charge. Last year, Open Arms served nearly 1,000 individuals. While most of our clients are women, Open Arms believes strongly, strongly in the importance of fathers. Almost 300 of our clients were male partners who met with a male team member and were educated and challenged in their role as provider and protector of their unborn child. As a Christian ministry, we also care for the spiritual well-being of our clients. Our aim is to share the gospel with any client open to having that discussion. Last year, we were able to share the good news of Jesus Christ, or at least engage in spiritual conversation with almost 900 of those 1,000 uh, people that we saw. Open Arms is not a political organization. However, the political climate does impact our work greatly. Last year was a great year in our nation with the ruling of in the Dobbs case with overturned Roe v. Wade. With the ruling approaching, many clinics, many clinics were threatened. Some were firebombed, vandalized, and staff were threatened. We were. Despite the threats, open arms stayed open, and thankfully, um, those threats did not 
realize in any violence against us personally. Even though Roe v. Wade was overturned, oh, abortion remains very, very legal in California. Californians voted in favor of Proposition 1 last year, which sadly legalizes abortion through all stages of a pregnancy. We are getting more and more calls from women who are very late in their pregnancy wanting abortions. Not only this, but we're getting calls from women outside of California planning to travel here because they can't get their abortions there in their state. More than ever, women and men need the life-affirming services that Open Arms offers. As a Christian ministry, Open Arms needs you, the church. We invite you to pray for us and for our clients. This is a spiritual battle, and we need prayer and support. We welcome you to partner with us financially as well. We are not gov government-funded, and we exist by God's grace through private donations. We realize, and I realize, anytime I talk about the subject of abortion, there are people in the audience who may grieve a past abortion. Open Arms wants to help you experience healing and forgiveness. We offer a post-abortion small group Bible study for women and one-on-one -on -one counseling with men. Please let us help if you need. I want to thank Pastor Barth. <laughs> for his care, his, his passion, and his love for the unborn and to support our clinic. Uh, it is uh, vital and wonderful to see. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. So don't go away yet. We're going to have a prayer. Why don't you come on up? And we'll get this going. Yes, sir. By the way, uh, this last year, we had two things to support them. One was the Lenten Gleaners, and then we did Baby Bottle, didn't we? Last year sometime. So let's pray for Alex. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this Pentecost Sunday. And we thank you, dear Father, that you are the creator of each one of us. You give us life. You give us breath. You give us our years and our talents and our gifts in this world. And we thank you, dear Lord for each life. Dear Father in heaven, help us to value life, especially those that are unwanted and need our help and our service. Dear Lord, thank you for Alex and all those involved in this, in, in preserving the life of unborn children. Watch over them, dear Father, and be with our country that we may have a, a heart, a heart for those children to enable them to be able to Live life to the fullest, as you intend. Bless us, bless them, dear Lord. Be with them and their families and loved ones. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Have a good day. So we're going to continue with the opening uh, song, um, which is, Lord, I lift your name on high. And I'm not going to have you sit for this one, so please rise as we sing. sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my death to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the I'm so glad 
In our time together, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the Pentecost litany, or liturgy. Holy Spirit, Creator, in the beginning you moved on the face of the waters. Through your breath all things came to life. Come, Holy Spirit, and dwell among us. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Consecrator, by your action, Jesus grew in wisdom and grace. You descended upon him in the form of a dove at his baptism to be a faithful witness to the Father. O oh, Holy Spirit, you have been sent into the lives of God's people by the Lord Jesus. You descended upon the apostles in the form of tongues of fire, through your messengers, you proclaim Jesus as Lord to the ends of the earth. Holy Spirit, comfort us. Through you, we are born as children of the Father. Make each of us a living temple of your presence and pray for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we gather together this Pentecost Sunday to celebrate the joy of faith and life as your dear children. Now hear us as we pray, and let us pray. Dear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do thank you that you have empowered the lives of your people in this world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, dear Holy Spirit, that you continue to touch our lives, to believe and to trust in Jesus as our Savior. So continue to use us, dear Holy Spirit, and mold us and build us and change us so that we may truly be disciples of the Lord Jesus who love him and serve him. Bless us, dear Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take the time to greet those around you this morning.
So this was a fatal? Well, yeah, we're going to have a prayer for this, okay, for this family. So before we continue on with the song, um, Norlene gave me a note here that her grandson, Jason, uh, was injured in an accident in Washington and passed away yesterday, huh? 40-some years old. And uh, so let's just, did he have a family of his own? He did. He did. Um, Three children. Oh, my. Three children, she said. So let's pray for him, for his family. Dear Father in heaven, as we live our days in this world, we know that tragic accidents happen every day and all time, all during the days. Dear Lord, today we raise up Jace, the family of Jason Kanyu as his life was taken from him yesterday in a car accident. Dear Lord, be with his family, his children and loved ones, wherever they might be. And dear Lord, be with them through this time. Comfort them through this. And dear Lord, give them a sense of your peace and your presence. Dear Father in heaven, we also include all others who lose loved ones through accidents and unexpected events. Dear Lord, even in death, though, you give all who believe in you the gift of eternal life. Into your hands we commend Jason and this family. In Jesus' name. Our sympathy to you and your family. Yeah. So let us sing, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Shine, Jesus, shine. 
nice to sing that. We haven't sung that in a while. Take out your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to John chapter 7, which you'll find on page 1,660. John chapter 7, page 1660, and we're going to begin with verse 33 and read through the end of the section. I'm going to start, okay, and uh, have you join me uh, after the first two paragraphs. Everybody there? Page 1660. All right, let me read. Jesus said... I am with you for only a short time, and then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live, scattered among the Greeks, and teach the Greeks? By the way, that's in our text for Pentecost. What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Please join me. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely the man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Christ. Others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. If you go back to that verse, he's supposed to come. How can the Christ come from Galilee? It's interesting. Even in the scriptures, we have prejudice, don't we? from where people come from. All right, turn to Acts chapter 2, page 1692. Some connections between the gospel and the text in Acts. Acts chapter 2, page 1692, we'll read it in a little bit. So the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost is the third great festival of the church year. It is third behind Easter and Christmas, yes. And it marks the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're going to focus, uh, the last part of the sermon is on the vital signs of the Holy Spirit. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles, and it is also the birth of the Holy Christian Church. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit with power. And the term Pentecost, you see it up there, Pentecost, for you who know Latin, what word is in Pentecost? Not cost. What is it? Penta. No, what does penta mean in Latin? Five, 50, right? Pentateuch, Pentagon, all that stuff. 50 days, Pentecost comes 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord or after, actually after uh, Passover, okay? And it was, it's known as the Feast of Weeks. Well, we'll come to that in Hebrew. But Pentecost is 50 days, and it's amazing how God times this. Hopefully, I, you, I will share that with you. So, let us begin with... The text for the day, are you ready to read all the names of all the countries? I think we should pick one of you to do that. Maybe we'll pick um, your son to come up and do that. No, okay, I'm sorry. 
Why don't you be, why don't, let's read together. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered together in one place. Suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, <coughs> filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speak in their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Jerusalem, Cretans and Arabs, who we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? <coughs> Some, however, made fun of them, said, they have had too much wine. They've been drinking. That's the it. Keep your Bibles open. Let's go through this. So in, on the Jewish calendar, Pentecost, we don't realize this, was the second great event, festival of the year. And it came 50 days after Pentecost. It celebrated the ingathering of grain in the spring of the year. And it was also known as the Feast of Weeks, seven weeks. And then came the day after, which was the Sunday. Everybody got that? Seven Sabbaths and then the Sunday. And it brought together, this is the interesting thing, keep this in mind. It brought together thousands of Jewish pilgrims from all around that world. Now I want you to think, of, you put in your mind's eye, see the map of the Mediterranean Sea. Everybody there? Israel is right in the middle. It is the converging point of three continents. Everybody understand that? You have Asia, Europe, and Africa all come together in the Holy Land. Do you think God planned that? Oh, I think he did. Okay? So anyway, these thousands of pilgrims come to Jerusalem for this event. It was also the anniversary of the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. We'll come back to that. So the group we met in chapter 1, they're all together. Remember that? The, 11, the disciples now, 12 of them. The women, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, and probably a whole bunch of others are gathered together yet again on this day. Okay? Where are we? Now, there are three signs of the presence of God. Do you know what the first one is? The sound of the wind. You betcha. The wind of God. And notice what, it, what kind of wind was it. Look at your Bible. What kind of wind was it? A violent wind. It wasn't a nice breeze. See, we would like the nice breeze. Oh, no. Not God. Not the Holy Spirit. It's a violent wind that comes in. Must have blown their hair around a little bit, don't you think? Must have blown. That's a sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit especially, but the presence of God. The word for Holy Spirit or the word for spirit in the Bible is, has three meanings. Panoima, anybody? Pneumatic, you've heard of pneumatic tools? Okay. Panoima in Greek has three meanings. The one is spirit. The second is wind. And the third is breath. Now think about that. Very descriptive term for the Holy Spirit. Let's go to wind. 
You can see the wind, right? Amen. You see the effects of the wind and you feel the effects of the wind, right? But you don't see it. We don't see the Holy Spirit like we see Jesus, but we can feel and see the effects of the Holy Spirit in our lives and others, right? Correct? Hopefully you have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's amazing how this all comes together. The wind, the power of the Spirit, Almighty God is there. What's the second one? Oh, come on. Tongues of fire are on their foreheads. You go to fire in the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, the fire is the symbol of God's presence. Okay? Let me go through it. God's presence. The first one, anybody want to guess? What's the first episode of fire? Moses and the burning bush. Absolutely. Then we move on to the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years at in night, during the night. Anybody remember that? In the book of Exodus. All right, we're moving on. Now, the second, the third one is Mount Sinai. When Moses went up to get the commandments and God and the children of Israel were camped around there. Anybody remember that? What happened to the mountain? It was filled with fire and smoke as a symbol of divine presence. Okay? which scared the children of Israel. And I got one more, I think. Oh, yes, I love this one. Mount Carmel. Remember the prophet Elijah? When the prophets of Baal were offering their sacrifices, they were cutting themselves, pounding themselves, and nothing came from Baal. And Elijah says, where's your God? Why don't you pray a little harder? Cut yourselves a little bit more. And then he prays to God. He says, Lord... Show your presence and show your power. And what happens? Consuming fire comes down from heaven and consumes both sacrifices. The fire. What's the third symbol of the presence of God? The inspi inspired speech in different languages. It's called the miracle of communication. To the God-fearing Jews, where'd they come from? From Jerusalem, but also all around the world. Okay, we're coming to that in a moment. God-fearing and devout Jews. They heard them speak in their own language. And here we have the universal message of the gospel. Keep that in mind. The, the people are utterly amazed, all right? They're all Galileans. Remember, they're Galileans. Who wants a Galilean? They're Galileans, and yet we all hear them in our own language. What does this mean? And we have this impressive roll call of the nations. And three continents are, are included in that roll call. Asia, off to the east. Europe, to the west and north. And Africa, to the south. Thousands of Jews had scattered around the then known world and established synagogues in numerous places. Everybody remember that? We forget about that. And now thousands had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. All right, we're coming almost to the end. There are two responses to this, okay? What's the response? Look at verse, look at verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they ask each other, what? What does this mean? They must have been Lutheran. <laughs> because that's our Lutheran phrase, right? What does this mean? They were Lutheran. I had to be. All right? They wanted to know more. They wanted to know, what does this mean? They wanted to know, we hear this, but that we can't understand it, but why is this happening? What does this mean? We're coming to that in a moment. But look at the next group. Some, however, did what? Made fun of them and said, they've been drinking. Those two groups are still around in our world today when the gospel is preached. 
There are always those who want to hear more and ask the question, well, what does this mean? Pastor, I don't understand the Bible. Can you explain this to me? And then there are those who hear, hear, hear something of God, and what do they do? They smile, and they, in their own mind, they say, that's ridiculous, and they walk away. Still around today. Bet you got them in your family. I bet you got them with friends and others. Some of them are responsive, and some of them ridicule and make fun. You're, and have anybody ever, anybody ever tell you you're an idiot for believing in Jesus? I've had that. You're an idiot. Yeah, still there. All right, let's move on. Then comes Peter's sermon. If you got your Bibles open, then comes Peter's addresses the crowd. His sermon, his speech, whatever you want to call it. All right, <clears throat> and, he, and that and when they said you're all drunk, Peter got to his feet. That got him up, and he speaks to the crowd of fellow Jews from around the world and those in Jerusalem. This is not wine talking, he says. <laughs> this isn't wine talking. This is the Holy Spirit talking as was promised by the prophet Joel. In verse 22 and following, now Peter gives them the gospel about Jesus Christ, who came into this world, but he was crucified, he was nailed to the cross. But guess what? God raised him from the dead. And now his name is to be preached to the ends of the earth. He is our Savior and Lord. Okay? God raised him. He quotes King David. And finally he says, we are witnesses. Now look at, if you got your Bible open, I hope you do, go turn the page and look at the last, look at, the, look at verse 41. Everybody with me? Those who accepted his message were baptized. Read it with me. And about... That's the group that stayed around. That's the group that asked, what does this mean? The other ones left, but this group stayed around. Repent and be baptized. And 3,000 were. Now here is something you need to understand. What's the significance of this? Come on, people of God. What? What happened next? Not in the book of Acts. What happened next? You got all these pilgrims from all around the then known world. 3,000 of them have come to accept Jesus. Jews, devout Jews, God-fearing Jews. Now what happened? They all went home. That's right. They all went home. And what did the many of them do? They shared the gospel. Now you can't tell me that's not a divine thing. God did this Pentecost event on purpose, on that day, because God knew all these pilgrims would be coming to Jerusalem. <coughs> and he knew that many of them would come to Jesus. But he also knew what? They were going back home and they could share, take the gospel with them. You know what we call that? You probably can't see this, but this is from Lutheran Hour Ministries. We call that the globalization of the gospel. Isn't that crazy? And it's still going on today, 2,000 years But this all happens by accident, of course. Those who walked away, they jeered, made fun. All right, <clears throat> last part of the sermon. I want to talk about the vital signs of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine. Think about this. Can you list? I've got, I've probably got eight to ten, maybe not quite, Vital signs of the Holy Spirit. Can any of you tell me the first one, the most important one? 
the vital sign of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine. Anybody on screen? You want to just shout through the television camera? Oh, come on. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. The first vital sign of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is that people, you and me, the first vital sign in your life and mine is that the Holy Spirit has opened our hearts and our minds to ask the question, what does this mean? In confirmation class, hopefully. And now God has opened the life of Jesus and we have received and accepted him as my personal Savior who died for me. The first and the greatest vital sign of the Holy Spirit is that you and I are here today. Unless somebody just dragged us and we really don't care and we're jeering and making fun. But if we're serious, you are a vital, the vital sign of the Holy Spirit is that you love and know the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Spirit. That's one. I got lots more. Let me move on. The Spirit, once he comes into our lives, what does he start doing? Changing us. Thank you. He starts to renew us. He starts to change our personality where we act differently, at least hopefully he does, where we have a different outlook, we think differently, different priorities come into our mind and in our heart. It's not all about me. I'm doing this Bible class on miracles. You guys ought to be there. You really should. Because one of the things on po God's power over the will, over the powers of darkness, the way of the powers of darkness, we just went through this in Bible class today, is all about me. And one of the things, the first things the Holy Spirit does, he starts changing you. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. The Spirit starts changing us and molding us. He, he comes into our lives. I got a couple of words here. This infusion, enabling, impelling us to change and have a different attitude and outlook on life a deeper understanding of the things of God. We look at the world not like the rest of the world. We look at the world through what? The Lord Jesus Christ. And the Spirit points us to him. The list goes on. Number three, the Holy Spirit helps you and me do what? Good works, right? To do the good God wants us to do. It's not all about me. It's about me being a blessing to others. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. The Holy Spirit begins to change us and helps us to do good works. And to care. And fourthly, I don't know what number we're up to. But fourthly, the Holy Spirit now leads us to care about what? The mission of God, the kingdom of God. We care about missions here and around the world, the globalization of the gospel. We care about caring for those in need and, 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 and doing God's work. The Spirit impels us to serve the Lord Jesus in ministry. It's not just about me be having my needs taken care of. It's about me, God using me to be a blessing to others. The Holy Spirit, here's number five, a vital sign of the Holy Spirit. He teaches you and me how to pray. He teaches us how to pray. He humbles us. And a big part of our prayer life is what? What's a big part of our prayer life? 
confession, thank you. We admit to God our sins, our shortcomings, our failures, and we pray for a Holy Spirit power to help us change and to do the good God wants us to do. We pray for those in need because the Spirit is changing us. I got two more to go. Anybody want to guess? The Holy Spirit sends us the fruits of the Spirit. Say them with me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and the one we all need, self-control. He begins to give us those fruits in our lives. And the last one I got, there's probably more, he gives us his gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. Everybody remember those? Where he gives us specific gifts to do God's work in this world. Every one of you is gifted with a spiritual gift. And I wonder, if you don't know it, you need to find out what it is. And some of you may have two or three. So how do we end this? I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, dear Holy Spirit, for all that you do in my life and in your life. And I invite you to say thank you to the Holy Spirit and to praise him for what he's done in your life. And pray for the Spirit to change you, but to be thankful. You know, you look at your life and how God has guided and directed. Maybe you, maybe you don't but I do. And I look, I look at how God guided me in my journey of 71 years. And I just have to say, thank you, dear Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. We're going to continue with the offering of our gifts and tithes, <coughs> excuse me, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're going to sing the song for the day, the Spirit Song.
That was a nice song, wasn't it? Take out your uh, insert, turn to uh, Faith and Fellowship page. A whole lot of folks for us to pray for. I'm going to give you uh, time for personal private prayer, okay? And I'm going to give you time to pray for individuals. And we're also celebrating Memorial Day, so we need to take time to remember and to give thanks for the people God has put in our, in our lives. So, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, on this, the day of the Feast of the Holy Spirit, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives in the life of your kingdom here and around the world. And dear Lord, first of all, we pray for all of our brothers in the faith around the world, most of whom we don't even know. But we share one thing in common, and that is the presence of the Holy Spirit, his power in our lives, who has led us and guided us to believe and accept Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord. And so, dear Lord, this day we pray for the globalization of the gospel. We pray for all those scattered in the countries of the world and for the sharing of the gospel yet to those nations to those people's groups who have not received or heard the message of the, gospel, of the book of Acts and the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, be with all those who serve in your kingdom here and around the world and bring your gospel to many more people. Lord, in your mercy, Today, dear Lord, we pray for all those on our prayer list, those men and women and even some children who are suffering with physical ailments, cancer, hospitalizations, and recovering from issues at hand. Dear Lord, we take time to privately and personally raise those on our hearts and minds in prayer before you. Lord, in your mercy. We pray again, dear Lord, for the family of Jason Kanyu as he was killed yesterday in Washington. And dear Lord, again, watch over this family. Comfort them and fill them with your peace. And dear Lord, may your Holy Spirit rest upon them, even in this time of sadness, loss, and, and probably chaos in their life. Give them a sense, dear Holy Spirit, that their lives are in your hands. We also take this time on Memorial Day weekend to remember family, friends, and loved ones, and others who have gone before us, and to thank and to remember them, and to thank you, Lord, for their lives. Hear us as we privately again give thanks to you. We remember with thanksgiving, dear Lord, all those who have served our country, those who gave up their lives to preserve this nation. But we also pray for all those who continue to serve in the armed forces of this land, and also those who serve at home in the police, in law enforcement and fire departments, dear Lord, those who protect us each and every day. Dear Father in heaven, we raise up these individuals on this Memorial Day. Thank you for them. We pray for their welfare. Lord, in your mercy. And everything else, dear Father, we include in the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit bless you this day in Jesus' name. Before we uh, close with the last closing song, I just want to share a story. I'm at a loss here. I shared this in Bible class today, and you may think this is corny, but it's another example of how God provides. Because a lot of the miracles in the Bible in Jesus' ministry, he provided. Feeding the 5,000, turning water into wine. So this last week, um, I was kind of in charge of the meal, which is always a dangerous thing. And then people couldn't make their pick up routes, you know, for food, but God provided for them. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, whoever that other person was who stepped up, uh, Andy Marisi, and provided picking up food. But then on Thursday morning, you know, we had a nice plenty of food for the 40-some people we serve. We had food, made a salad, but we didn't have much desserts. So we had a few cookies I was, we were able to put in there, but we don't, had less than half of what we needed. So here it is, Thursday morning, we're getting ready to serve. It's probably close, 10.30, qu quarter to 11, something like that. I'm over at the pantry. I don't know what I was doing, but I said to Allison, I said, I can't find any desserts for today. So she had this box. I guess you picked that up. And so with, she said, well, let's open this. So we opened it. And guess what was in there? <laughs> desserts. More than enough for what we needed and enough for next week. Now, I don't know about you. That may be a dumb story. You could say, well, it was dumb luck. But let me just tell you, that kind of stuff happens every week in that ministry. How God provides things beyond our wildest dreams. That's, folks, why you've got to give the kingdom of God and your, ministry, your life and my life and ministry up to the Lord and say, Lord, you provide through us and beyond us. Amen? Dumb little stories, but powerful. All right, let's close. I sing the VBS song, if I remember, correct? It was. I sing the mighty power of God. You and me, Larry, you're going to lead us, right? We repeat the top, and then there's no greater power. I don't remember this so much. Sing the wisdom that
Have a good day, everybody, and Jesus bless you. Sing the Bible.